Okay, so today we are going to look at graphing the reciprocal functions, right? The other three that we haven't talked about yet. So we have cosecant first, so we would have f of x equals cosecant of x. Cosecant is the reciprocal of what? Sine, yes. So I'd have 1 over sine theta. So just like we came up with our cosecant values going through sine on the unit circle, and what I mean by that is if I asked you what is the cosecant of pi 6, okay, the way I think about it is that, okay, cosecant of pi 6, I know that cosecant is reciprocal of sine, sine of pi 6 is 1 half, so then the cosecant is 2 right? I always think about my sine, cosine, or tangent values to get the reciprocal values. So we're going to do the same kind of thing with the graph. So if you're using Kami, I want you to use, to choose like a really, like a light color like this. Or, and if you're on paper, then you're just going to do it lightly and you're going to dot it. I'm going to dot mine and use that just because I can get the graph to look a little bit better that way. So what we're going to do, since this is the reciprocal of sine, we're going to lightly sketch in a cycle of sine, just kind of like, so it ends up being like in the background for us, something for us to use. So I know for sine, I'd have zeros here. At pi halves, I'd be at one. Three pi halves, I'd be at negative one. So I'm just going to kind of lightly sketch this on here, because it's not really part of the graph. And we're not going to do this every single time. We're just doing this to come up with the graph the first time, just so you kind of like a little shadow of a sign on there. Okay. All right, so then here at zero, obviously the sine of zero is zero, so what would the cosecant of zero be? What's the reciprocal of zero? Undefined. So for undefined on a graph, we have an, we have an asymptote. So everywhere that sine is zero, cosecant is undefined, so that'll actually give me three asymptotes on this cycle. So then at pi halves, the sine of pi halves is one. What's the reciprocal of one? It's still one. I usually get like blank stares or weird answers. It's not a trick question. It's still one. Then at three pi halves, sine is negative one. The reciprocal of negative one is still negative one. Right? Now, if you've never seen cosecant before, not sure what to do, this may not be enough with those points to figure things out. So we're going to, for this one part, we're going to graph some more, but we're not going to have to use those points every time. <laughs> That's right. So then pi fourths, all right, what's the sine of pi fourths? Square root of two over two, right? Or is this one? So then this cosecant is just what? Square root of two. Okay, so now you may not know what the decimal approximation of that is, and that's fine. And we're, like I said, we're not going to use it every time, but I'm just going to tell you for this purpose here. It's about 1.41 something. So at pi fourths, we're going to plot about 1.4. So every pi fourths angle on the unit circle is going to give me the square root of 2, but sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, depending on what quadrant we're in, right? So when I get to 3 pi fourths, that's in the second quadrant of the unit circle. Is sine positive or negative there? All students take calculus. It's positive, right? So that means that pi, 3 pi fourths, I'm still at about 1.4. When I move to 5 pi fourths, I'm in the third quadrant of the unit circle. Sine down there is negative, so this is going to be negative 1.4. In the third quadrant, sine is still negative, so it's still down here. So even though we have all these asymptotes, it doesn't look anything like the tangent graph did, where it came down through the x-axis. Instead, instead of these looking kind of like cubics, these look kind of like parabolas. Again, they're not parabolas, but they have that parabolic look to them like so. Exactly. It's like, that's why I like to have that sine graph sketched in the background so that you can see you're kind of taking the sine graph and turning it inside out. Because it, it is the reciprocal of it, but it's not like a reflection type of thing. So yeah, it's like they bounce off of each other. And so if you can see it like that, you can see how they match up and that you would have that gap there. Okay. So now that we have this, this is one cycle, which means our period is 
2 pi, just like it is for sine. But we can go ahead and repeat this. I've got an asymptote here and here. And then here I would be down at negative 1, and here I'd be up at 1. And those other points, we're not going to have to graph. We just did that so you could kind of see what was happening. We could even graph more and get it more accurate. But just having these and knowing what happens and getting this shape in there is totally good enough. So when we go to graph these with transformations, the little parent function I want you to sketch is not cosecant, because that could be a little much here. Instead, since we're using sine now, we're just going to sketch the sine parent function again. It's one less thing you have to remember. And then I'll show you how we'll use it when we actually do the transformations. Okay? Everybody good on that? Okay. So then let's look at some of this information. We've got, so our domain. Well, our domain is all kinds of interrupted with these asymptotes again. So domain, set of all x's such that x cannot equal. So I have an asymptote at 0, and then it happens every pi. So this would be n times pi, where n is an element of the integers. So is my range all real numbers? No, because I, I have this huge gap, right? This huge gap in here, that's a problem. But I do start at negative infinity. Don't include it because we never include our infinities. I go up to negative 1, and then I start over at 1 and go to infinity. Do I have any zeros? Do I cross the x-axis at all? Nope, so I've got none. Do I have any y-intercepts? Nope, that's a none also. Asymptotes, I definitely have those, and remember that your domain and your asymptotes are very much tied together, so x does equal n times pi, where n is an element of the integers. I still can't find max and min, which means I can't have an amplitude. So this is does not exist again. The only graphs that actually have amplitude, and it's called that, is sine and cosine. And then the period is 2 pi, just like sine was. Any questions? OK. So let's look at our transformations. f of x equals a times the cosecant of b times x minus c plus d. So this is still no amplitude, but it's just the absolute value of a, and it's still your vertical stretch or compression. period is still one cycle. Yesterday we talked about tangent and we used pi, but we're back to 2 pi divided by the absolute value of b. Frequency is still the absolute value of b, which would be 2 pi divided by the period is how I would find that. Phase shift is still c. Vertical shift is still D. Midline is still Y equals D. Any questions at all? Good. Okie dokie. Then let's look at secant. So F of X equals secant of x. Secant theta is 1 over cosine theta. So we're going to use cosine like we did sine for the other one to help us get what we need. So I'm going to sketch in my 
cosine parent function. And I'll put little points on here so I can make sure I hit my mark and don't look at it wrong. So get cosine in the background there. So remember, we're going to look for the reciprocal value. So when the angle is zero, the cosine is one, and then the reciprocal of one is still one. The reciprocal of this one is still one. The reciprocal of negative one, still negative one. And then when cosine is zero, what is secant? Asymptote. It's undefined. So the asymptotes go in here. Exactly. So that's actually just exactly what I was about to say. Just like cosine is just sine shifted over, secant is just cosecant shifted over. Because we're really just, you know, taking, turning them inside out. So we can go ahead and repeat this so we can fill it in. Then let's see, I was down here, then up here, so then I'm down here again. Then I go up here again. And we're not even going to worry about the square root of two values, because if you know it's the same as the other one, and they're going the other ways, we can just sketch that in. Try not to make them look like Vs. Not an art class, but it needs to look like you made an honest attempt. And then since this is the reciprocal of cosine, it's the cosine parent function that we'll draw and we'll use to come up with that. And I'll show you how we're going to do that once we get to one. Any questions about the graph? Okay. So, and I'm showing you this part because basically if you can understand sine and cosine, you can figure these out if you know how they're connected. Okay, so my domain, I got those asymptotes again. So it's a set of all x's such that x cannot equal, they still happen every pi, so it's n times pi, but it doesn't start on the y-axis, so I have to add pi halves to that to move it over, where n is an element of the integers. The range is the same as it was for cosecant. Do I have any zeros? Do I cross the x-axis at all? Nope. No. Do I have any y-intercepts? That I do, because there's not an asymptote there. There's a point, and it's at 0, 1. At least it's easy. Asymptotes, I don't even have to look at my graph because I know that's what's upsetting my domain. So I can use this right here. X is equal to n times pi plus pi halves, where n is an element of the integers. Still no amplitude. And the period is still 2 pi. All right, transformations, f of x equals a times the secant of b times x minus c plus d. Now, this stuff up here was different than cosecant. Everything we're going to write in here is exactly the same as cosecant. So once you write this down, we're going to leave this blank for now. You can go in and fill it in later. Because that way, if we skip this, I think I can get to that last example. I'd rather finish the examples than just fill in the same stuff. I know it gets a little repetitive, but the more repetitive it is, the more it gets stuck in your brain. But it's also good to have everything all together in one. So just come back and fill that in. It's the same as the other one. But it won't be the same for this one, so we will do this one all together. Cotangent. Go ahead. 
close. Close. Sorry, that's that's part of it. F of x is equal to, and I like, but I like that you're thinking about it instead of just waiting. F of x equals tangent of x. No, it doesn't. Sorry. I said tangent and threw me off. <clears throat> yeah, it's fine. Oh, I, but yeah, but I caused myself confusion. It's not really your fault. All right, so then I get, so that means that the cotangent of theta is equal to 1 over the tangent of theta. So we're going to do the same thing that we did on the other two is sketch that parent function in, in the background there. So I have zeros at 0 and at pi, an asymptote at pi halves. At pi fourths, I'm at 1. 3 pi fourths, I'm at negative 1. So it looks kind of like this. That's my background. Okay, so what we have sketched in the background there is tangent. So that means that the tangent of zero is zero, and the reciprocal of that is undefined, which means I have an asymptote. So everywhere where tangent is zero, we have an asymptote for cotangent. Then at pi halves, tangent is undefined, but what's the value of cotangent? pi halves. It's not technically it's not the reciprocal of undefined but it's how do you get undefined you get like something over zero so if we reflect or if we take the reciprocal we get zero over that thing right so anywhere where tangent is undefined cotangent is zero and vice versa then at pi fourths the tangent is one now you get it yeah there you go so at tan um, when at pi fourths tangent is one the reciprocal of that is one at 3 pi 4, it's negative 1, so it's negative 1. So when I sketch it in, it does look a lot like tangent, but not only is it shifted over, but it's also reflected in the x-axis. So when we draw the little parent function, like to graph these, for secant and cosecant, I think it's good to use sine and cosine, because it's just one less thing to remember. But when you do tan cotangent, I wouldn't suggest doing tangent. I would suggest actually using cotangent, which looks like this. And that's one reason why I was encouraging you yesterday when you're doing tangent, draw the little tangent every time so you're not getting it mixed up with cotangent. If you actually do it every time, you're way less likely to get them confused with each other. And then we're going to go ahead and repeat this over here and fill up this graph. So I have an asymptote every pi. Repeat our little patterns here. Any questions at all? Okay. So I, I don't think you're going to get like cosecant and sine mixed up, but tangent and cotangent, you could get mixed up. So make sure you, you know, have a picture in your mind of which way it curves and which one starts on zero and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's look at this information. Domain. I bet you at this point, you maybe you could write this for yourself here. It's the set of all x's such that x cannot equal wherever the asymptotes are. They're every pi, and they start at 0, so it's just n times pi, where n is an element of the integers. Is there anything keeping my range from being all real numbers? Nope. So that's going to go from negative infinity to infinity. Back to having zeros and a whole bunch of them. They are spaced every pi, but they don't start at zero. So I'm going to say it's the set of all x's such that x does equal n times pi, 
but I have to shift it over. So I do a plus pi halves where n is an element of the integers. Do I have a y-intercept? No, so this is none. Asymptotes, yep, I got those. And I can get that from the domain. So x equals n times pi, where n is an element of the integers. Amplitude still does not exist. And we're back to pi for the period. So for tangent and cotangent, your parent function period is pi. All the other four, it's two pi. Okay, so again, make sure you keep that straight because no matter how good you are at the graphing stuff, if you mess up the period, it's going to mess up the whole graph no matter what you do. Okay, we good? All right, so transformations. We do need to talk through these. But f of x equals a times the cotangent of b times x minus c plus d. A is still the absolute value of A, still the vertical stretch or compression. Period is still one cycle. And to find it, it's the, it's 2 pi, no it's not, it's pi, sorry, it's kind of brain part there. It's cotangent, so it's pi. pi divided by the absolute value of b. Frequency is still the absolute value of b, and that would equal pi divided by the period. Phase shift is still c, vertical shift is still d, midline still y equals d. Any questions at all? I know this is a long lesson today. It's a lot of writing, but you'll survive, I promise. I might have split it up if I was going to be here tomorrow, but it's probably better that we get it all out of the way and then you just have time to graph. Okay. All right. If there's no questions, then let's go on to the second part, which is this. Now, we were up here at the top going to sketch it, these real quick, but we're not going to do that because we've already drawn them. And if you want to go back and sketch them in so that they're here, you're welcome to do that, but we're just going to skip that or it's just going to be way too much to do. So we're going to start here. Okay, so the period of cosecant and secant is 2 pi divided by the absolute value of b. The period of cotangent is pi divided by the absolute value of b. So remember the differences between the two with the pi and the 2 pi. All righty, the number one, A is three halves. We got that. The frequency is one, so for cosecant, what would that make the period? Two pi. There is not a phase shift, midline, Y equals zero. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so I'm going to draw in my little sine function here and sketch in my midline. Okay. Everywhere sine is zero, I will have an asymptote for cosecant. So this is on the y-axis. The only thing that would change that is if I have a phase shift, and I don't, so I have an asymptote right here. Then this asymptote would be at the end of the period, which is at 2 pi. And the only thing would change that is a phase shift, and I don't have one, so I put this asymptote on 2 pi. Then everything else is half, half, half. So this asymptote's halfway in between. That happens to still be at pi. Then, halfway between these two asymptotes, I should be at 1. There is no reflection, but A is 3 halves, so instead of going to 1, I'm going to 1 and half. So halfway between these two asymptotes from the midline, I go up one and a half. Halfway between these two from the midline, I go down one and a half. 
that's everything I get from my parent function, then I just repeat it. Any questions <clears throat> on number one? All right, so let's look at number three. There is no number two. The numbering on this is all off, but that's fine. Makes it look like we're doing more than we are. All right, so number four, I'm number three, good Lord. This is negative, so I'm gonna reflect in what? the x-axis. And so somebody earlier today said it doesn't matter. It does matter. So maybe my little brain activity yesterday wasn't so great. It depends on the function. Maybe it matters. Maybe it doesn't matter. Honestly, at this point, I don't even know. But since I'm not sure, that means I'm reflecting an x. So that's what I'm going to do just in case it does make a difference. But because of that, a is 1. My frequency, though, is 4 thirds. Since this is secant, my parent function period is 2 pi. So I would multiply that by 3 fourths. It's fine to do it in your head, but you might want to jot some numbers down just so that the numbers don't get mixed up in your head. And then that would give me 3 pi halves. There is no phase shift. Midline, y equals 0. OK, secant is a reciprocal of cosine. So I'm going to sketch in my little cosine. And I'm going to sketch in my midline. Okay, so from the parent function, this would be the midline 0, 1. A is still 1, so I know the distance is still 1. But this is negative, which means I reflect. So instead of going up, I'm actually going down 1 from the midline. So it would be here. This has the same y value as wherever I just put that point, And it needs to go at the end of the period, which is at 3 pi halves, unless there's a phase shift, which there's not. So I'll go to 3 pi halves and I should have the same y value. Then half, half, half. Halfway between these two, I would be down, except I'm supposed to go up because there's a reflection. So 3 pi halves, half of that's 3 pi fourths. So I end up right there. And then halfway between those two points is an asymptote and one over here. So halfway between these two, I'm actually halfway in the middle of a box here. and right here. Any questions about where anything came from, how I got to where I am, anything? Okay, so if that makes sense to you, then we're going to just repeat it. Fill everything in. Any questions at all? All right, then we are going to skip to number five, I think. I think there's no four either. Yep, we're going to number five. If you printed these out sometime, I don't remember when I fixed this, if it was yesterday or this morning, but it's possible. I did have it uploaded with a different number here. I don't even remember what the number was, but just make sure if you have a printed copy that this actually says one half so that you're not confused about whatever's going on. Okay, so A is three. My frequency is one half. This is cotangent whose parent function is pi. So the period would be what? 
It's now two pi because of this. I do not have a phase shift. Midline y equals zero. This is cotangent, so I would draw the actual parent function of cotangent, which looks like this. And my midline, which is at y equals zero. So I have an asymptote on the y-axis unless I have a phase shift, and I don't, so it's on the y-axis. So I have this one. This one goes at the end of the period, which in this case is at 2 pi, and there's no phase shift, so I have an asymptote here at 2 pi. Halfway between these two asymptotes, I would have a midline zero. So halfway between those two, and my midline is on the axis, so I'm good. Halfway between these two, parent function I'd be at 1, but A is 3 with no reflection, so I'll actually go up 3 from the midline. So halfway between these two from the midline, I go up 1, 2, 3. And then halfway between these two from the midline, I go down 3. Those are my five anchor pieces. Then I can just repeat that and finish my graph. It would look like that. Any questions at all? All right, so there's no number six either, so we're already on number seven. All right, so we have a cosecant graph. A is one, the frequency is one, so since it's cosecant, the period is two pi. I do have a phase shift. I'm moving to the right pi fourths. In my midline, y equals negative two. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So there's my sine parent function and my midline y equals negative 2. Okay. For cosecant, everywhere there's a 0 for sine, there would be a vertical asymptote, which means I would have an asymptote on the y-axis unless I have a phase shift, which I do here. So my, my asymptote that would be on the y-axis mo gets moved to the right pi fourths, so it actually ends up here. Then this asymptote would be at the end of the period, and the period's at 2 pi, but I have a phase shift, so I'm going to think it would be here, but I have to move to the right pi fourths, and there is the end of the period. Once I have the beginning and the end, I don't worry about the shifts anymore, it's just half, half, half. So halfway between these two is my third one which would be right here, that's this. Halfway between these two asymptotes, I would be at one. A is one and there's no reflection, so from the midline, I'm going up one. Halfway between these two asymptotes, from the midline, I go up one. And then halfway between the other two, from the midline, I go down one. So you might need to remind yourself you're going from the midline so you don't go from the axis because it's easy to mess that up sometimes. Any questions about where any of that came from? All right, so then we'll just repeat and fill it in. So here, here. Down here, up here, down here. Any questions about number seven? And I'm trying to give you enough time to graph. I realize some of you may not be done by the, with the graphs by the time I move on. If you've got at least most of it graphed and you could go back and finish it, then, then you're fine. All right, let's look at number eight. 
So a here is 2. I don't have to factor. So pay it, sometimes it's factored for you, sometimes it's not. We've had to factor on all these so far, but this one's factored for me. So I'm good. Frequency is 2. Since this is secant, that makes this period pi, because I would do 2 pi divided by 2. I do have a phase shift. I'm moving to the left pi, and my midline is y equals 1. This is secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine. So there's my cosine, and here's my midline. Okay, so this point right here would be my midline 0, 1, except this is 2. So I'll actually go up 2 because there's no reflection. But I have a shift, so it's not going to be on the axis. So I'm going to put my pin here from the midline. I would go up 2, but then I have to shift to the left pi, and my point would end up right there. Okay, so up two from the midline, phase shift to the left pi. This point would be the same y axis, or same y value, right? And then this would be at pi, because that's the end of the period, but I have a phase shift. So at pi, I'm going to go up two from the midline, and then shift to the left pi, there's the end of my period. Any questions about that so far? Huh? Yes, it does. It does. It ends up being where we didn't even have to do a shift. Halfway in between the two from the midline, I'm going down to. And then halfway in between each of those sets is where that asymptote's going to be. So I'm going to have one here and here. So you can get those. Let me know if you have any questions about where anything came from, and then you can repeat it and finish up your graph. And because the period ended up being pi and the shift was pi, if we graph this same function without a phase shift, it would look exactly the same. And that happens with some graphs. Okay, so then this last one, I think we'll get through this last one just fine. Any questions on this one? Okay. I don't even know why I ask anymore. Um, which is fine if you don't have any questions. I just makes me sad if you have questions and you won't want to ask. All right, so I've got A is 1. This is factored for me again. That's awesome. Frequency is 2. Since this is cotangent, parent function is pi, so this period is pi halves. I do have a phase shift. I'm moving to the right, 3 pi halves. In my midline, y equals negative 3. So since this is cotangent, I'm actually going to sketch in cotangent right there to use. Which means I would have an asymptote on the y-axis if I don't have a phase shift, but I do. So instead of it, oh, I didn't put it in my midline. Hang on. Midline, negative 3. Sorry. I will mess myself up if it's not there. So my asymptote would be on the y-axis, but I move to the right 3 pi halves. So I move to the right 3 pi halves. That's right here. And this is where that asymptote goes. So then this would be at the end of the period. The period, so I have this one, the period is pi halves. So I'm going to put, I would have an asymptote here, 
but I have to move to the right three pi halves. So this is one, two, three pi halves. Here's this. Then halfway between these two, I have a midline zero. So halfway between those two, midline zero. Halfway between the asymptote and the midline zero, I would go up one, which, and it's still one because the A is one and there's no reflection, and it's from the midline. So halfway between these two, from the midline, I go up one. So it is half, does have to be in, a, you know, in the middle there. And then halfway here, I go down one. And then this is going to have a ton of little things on there, but do you understand where those come from? Then we can just repeat that. So that means I skip one and have this. At least it's a repetitive pattern to be able to fill in. And I tried not to make too many of them where they had really small periods where you had to draw in like a ton of these. That's one of the reasons why I changed that one up there. So as I'm doing this, in case the bell rings on me, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Oh, I have a couple of minutes, but still. Um, tomorrow, there will be a discussion question for everybody, so make sure that you do it. Those of you that are virtual, that's your attendance. Those of you that are face-to-face, -face, I still want you to do it. It's just some quick information for me. It's not even technically a discussion question, I guess. But Any questions about this graph? Okay, I know that was a lot.